Hey guys, thanks for joining us. Today we're chatting with Merlin Chief Executive Charles Caldas. Um, Merlin, as you know, is the digital rights agency for about 20,000 independent labels worldwide. Charles, thanks for, Thank you. Nice thanks for chatting. Here. Nice to be here. Uh, so Merlin's very first licensing deal was with Spotify. How fortuitous was that? Um, it was all planned. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of a uh, bus, no one knows who they are, right? Yeah, we, we had the secret sauce from day one. No, I mean, really, that was um, a coincidence. You know, the, the period I spent prior to Merlin being being formally set up, we, we did a year's worth of looking at the market and trying to understand what, what the, you know, what the organization would look like, what the challenges were, what we'd actually be doing. And Spotify, at the same time, was running um, tests with university students in, in Stockholm, testing its product out. And they read about the formation of Merlin through a press release we put out at the Medium conference in 2007, I think. And actually contacted us saying, you know, we, um, you seem to be representing a lot of these artists that our students are asking for and these people are asking for. So it's kind of like a, a, a coincidental meeting of minds. But um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I'd like to take. Um, credit for predicting the future, but that was a <laughs> it was a good call combination of uh, of luck and timing. Yeah, so let's go back for a minute to kind of what the digital market looked like um, ten years ago and what the need was for an organization like Merlin. Um, what were the challenges indie labels were facing a decade ago? Well, I think I think a decade ago, and probably even slightly before that, with the emergence of iTunes and the and the and the, the global retailers, is the independent sector had always been constructed as a um, a network of specialized uh, companies within their territories. So my background was I ran a, a big distributor in Australia that looked after a lot of international labels in the market. We had uh, equivalents in the US and France and, 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 and Italy and Germany looking after our interests. So we had this network that was very, very effective by at leveraging local expertise for international independent repertoire, but it wasn't really set up to exploit content globally, it was very regionally based. So the, the, the emergence of you know, iTunes and the early um, streaming platforms, you know, Rhapsody and Microsoft's products meant that all of a sudden as, as a, a, an independent operating within a market, even as a big independent operating, say, in the German or Australian market, you're all of a sudden dealing in a global marketplace rather than within your, your, your own country. And that, that disconnect was really starting to cause what got a bunch of labels together to, to think about the specific challenges that were facing independence at that time, which was how do you, as a regional company, compete against the major labels who have these, these global deals and these global infrastructures across the planet? So uh, when I started talking to, to the labels who were concerned about this, the, the real concern was that as a big, even if, as a big independent label in, in Germany, for example, if you were so far down the licensing chain by, with these international platforms uh, that they were either not getting to you at all, or by the time they got to you, they had spent so much money in finding all of these independents and licensing them that they factored that cost into your deal, you'd be competing as an independent in a market where the majors were just automatically getting higher rates for their music than, than, than the independents were. And so that gap really was the the, the first thing we, we tried to address and, and looking at it from both ways, like looking at it from the service perspective, um, which was how do we offer all of our users all of the music in the world in the most efficient way possible without having to go one by one and find these thousands of independents around the world. And from our side and from the label side is was, you know, how can we in a compelling way get onto these platforms, monetize at an equivalent level to the majors and, um, uh, and be able to compete, uh, you know, toe to toe with them in terms of artist acquisition. Yeah. So, so that was the gap that we really tried to fill at the beginning. And and with that in mind, in in retrospect, how important was the structure of the organisation? Why did you describe yourselves as the the virtual fifth major? Well, I think we sensed from early on that this had to be something different. It had to be something that had never existed before because the market was something that, that never existed before. So there was no blueprint for this. We weren't building a distribution company that was going to um, insert itself in the value chain. What we really wanted to do was was create a healthy marketplace that allowed these labels to continue to, 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 do, their, uh, to do their best in, in marketing their artists around the world. 
the perception that had been building over, over time, particularly in the tech sector and the companies that were coming in um, from the technology side into the music side, was that the majors were the companies you really needed to worry about. They were big, they were global, they had the opportunity to hurt you, they had the superstar artists, so that was what you focused on. And then there was everything else. And the, there was this perception that the, the everything else was somehow people in, in bedrooms and people who were unprofessional or, or, or not able to properly exploit their music on these platforms. And we knew from the businesses that we all ran that that just simply wasn't true. So I think the, the, the virtual fifth major was almost a, um, um, a way of, of, of establishing the fact that from our perspective, we considered our rights inherently equal in value to that of the artists that were on the major labels. Mm -hmm. That from the consumer perspective, we had the utmost confidence that consumers valued that music as much as they would music from any other label. So really it was a way of, of, of um, illustrating um, this, this kind of belief that for a healthy digital ecosystem to, to, to emerge, all of this music needed to be on in a competitive way so that not only would the, the record companies and the services benefit, but ultimately the, the, the consumers would benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, just quickly on the structure you know, in terms of how we did it, we, because we were this, this collection of, of disparate independence, and I think at the beginning maybe you know, 100 or so companies from, from maybe 10 or 12 territories around the world, we, we really wanted to build something that was designed to flow the maximum amount of value through the organisation. So the last thing the market needed was another level of inefficiency, as it were. So if you, if you go back to what the, what the digital services were saying, well, you know, it just costs us too much money to fly someone to, to Germany to find all of these labels, to sign individual deals with them in a different language to ours, and we're going to, to, to pull that cost back. We wanted to just break that, that, that Im impediment, make, be global from the, from, from the outset, but also not remove any value. So we just wanted to um, be designed in a way that flowed every dollar possible through. And we, we continue that to this day. Mm -hmm. So the way the organization structured is we're a normal trading company. We do the best we can. We try and maximize our profits. We try and do the best deals we can. But outside of what it costs to run our business on a day-to-day -day basis and our various offices, all of those profits flow back down to the labels that participate in it. Mm -hmm. So that... that um, that flow of value from the top to the bottom of the market has to be as quick as possible to sustain this business. And I think if we hadn't have built it like that, I don't think this would be here today. Mm -hmm. um, and Merlin's early years involved some some pretty high profile spats, notably with MySpace. Mm -hmm. Did those uh, kind of stall? Did they help or kind of hurt the business? Um, I think in, in retrospect, they helped a lot. Um, I think at the time it felt like it was it was painful and difficult, and, and um, that we were we were constantly climbing walls. I mean, we, we talked about the the fortuitous meeting with Spotify very early on. You know, at that point in time, MySpace was the number one social platform on the planet, particularly for musicians, and it built this v enormous value of the company on the uploading of music by musicians around the world and the sharing of that music. When the News Corporation came in and, and bought the company and decided to try and commercialise that, rather than looking at who had actually built the value in, into MySpace, they did deals with the four major labels at the time and then you know, told, basically told the independents, you know, you should be really happy that your, your music's up next to Carly Rae Jepsen because your music's up next to Carly Rae Jepsen. You might get discovered too and you'll be on a real record label and you can have a real career. Yeah. And given what I've just said about re-establishing value, that was... Um, not a message we wanted to hear. So, so, so where it benefited, I think, is it not only, I think it taught us how to defend ourselves against big technology companies who just didn't understand our business, but I think for the independents globally that were, you know, in the, in the early days of, of, of Merlin, tentative about where this was going to sit in their business and whether it was going to be a net positive or, or whether it would even work as a concept, I think there was that rallying cry that actually saw that we were able to stand our ground, take on a company that felt that powerful at that time, um, get to a point where eventually they had, you know, they did do a deal with us because they realised that from their user's perspective it was absurd that, you know, at that time you could listen to 
um, not to pick on Carly Rae Jepsen, but you could listen, to, you could listen to Carly Rae Jepsen, but you couldn't listen to the Pixies, and it just seemed absurd. You know, that mm-hmm. there was, from a consumer perspective, that made that made no sense. Yeah, can you talk about that that battle for for market acceptance? Was there a moment when you kind of felt like progress was being made, or you know, we've made it? I, don't, I still don't know if we've made it, but but <laughs> the there was there there was definitely a few touch points where um, I think you know getting over the hurdle of that that early battle with with myspace was was it was important i think early on as well um early into our relationship i think spotify really noticed how well we were performing on their platform and because they were positioning th- themselves as the forward-looking company very early came out and i think they did a blog post or a press piece talking about the importance of independence to their business and how merlin alone was representing more than 10 percent of all the usage on their platform and we'd, we'd had these, you know, virtual fifth major and all of these little um, tags that we were trying to hang the organisation on. And that was the first time that someone on the other side actually validated that in a really, in a really direct way. Mm-hmm. Um, some people got the message and, and some people didn't because, you know, the battles in some ways have lasted up until, you know, very recently. But, but there was certainly those, those were, were tipping points where we certainly felt we could have a bit of wind in our sails and, and present ourselves with confidence in the marketplace. Yeah. So it became uh, pretty clear early on that, that you know, Merlin members were over-indexing on these um, digital platforms yeah. versus um, downloads and um, physical formats as well. Yeah. Um, why do you think that is? I think in some ways that the, the streaming platforms broke the challenge of availability of your music. So, you know, back when I used to run an independent distributor or, or, or a label even, the catch cry was, you know, if only I could get the song on the radio, people would love it. Or if only the, I could get this onto the shelves of the record stores, people would buy it. And if, if you weren't on the radio and you weren't on the shelves and the consumers walked into that retail environment, if you weren't there, you were effectively invisible. Even if someone had seen your band play at a club, you know, t- two or three nights before, it was difficult to, to, to get to that music. So the major labels had an in, inbuilt advantage in that world because they could afford to to pitch to radio, which is a very expensive business. They could afford to buy all of the nice, you know, front-facing uh, decks on the um, in the retail stores and the front windows and all the the marketing campaigns. They could afford to get their artists on television. So those narrow channels of, of discovery really benefited that 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 model. Um, the download market started to break that in that that challenge of availability wasn't there but the challenge and the cost of sampling the music was still there so even though the music was there you weren't really being presented in, in a way that pulled you in you know at the most you'd get a 30 second sample and then it, it would it would cut off i think the streaming platforms with the discovery the availability of discovery channels the playlisting the personalized curation all of a sudden meant that we, for probably the first time ever, were in this totally flat marketplace where, as uh, from a user experience, it didn't really matter where that music was from, how much money had been spent on the marketing campaign, um, whether the artist was on television or not, it was right there in front of you, discoverable. And, and, and to us, it, it was that, uh, you know, talking about the, 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 one of the tipping points, I think one of the tipping points for us was seeing that performance on those platforms really early on, realizing we were way over-indexing in market share compared to any of the other models we've seen, and realizing that, you know what, when this music is put in front of consumers in a really simple way to access, in a really compelling way that actually gets... Um, that removes all of those barriers of unavailability, consumers don't care. They just want great, great music. And independents put out really great music. Yeah. So I think, you know, th- that... Um, and that continues to this day, and we've seen that over-indexing in streaming and the health of independence as a whole, I think, has been really greatly benefited by that dynamic. Mm-hmm. So as, as Merlin's business has matured, um, you know, how, how have the DSPs kind of taken to Merlin? Um, when and how, you know, has, has the value of independent music kind of become clear? It, th- th- there's different answers for different platforms and different territories. I think that there's, you know, the, the, the general way of, of, of painting this is, you know, the, the, the platforms that have had a real vision and a real, um, uh, a really clear path to the consumer and have built their offering around that and not around the demands of the big record labels are the ones that have prevailed. You know, MySpace Music with its deals with the four majors disappeared. 
Uh, there was another example when Spotify was first rolling out. Um, in my old market in Australia, the, the major labels got together and thought, we're going to keep, keep Spotify out of the market by creating our own streaming service. And to the added genius of that story, they called it Songul, S-O-N-G-L. So if there's any marketing awards to be given today, <laughs> let's give that one. Um, <coughs> So, 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 you know, and services like that disappeared very quickly. MySpace Music just didn't last as a platform because they just got it wrong from day one. And one thing that consumers in the online space have is a lot of alternatives. Mm -hmm. And in those days, a lot of those alternatives led to piracy and led to just going to steal They were music. free. So you just got, you could just go and get it for free. Yeah. Um, so so that, that dynamic continues. Look, the, the pleasing thing is the longer this goes on and the more successful our labels become and the more the market, um, you know, grows and, and stabilises, the harder it is to build any sort of argument that says that this music is of inferior value because clearly whether you're looking at festival lineups at, at Coachella or the Primavera Sound that's coming up in Barcelona or whether you're looking at uh, the touring scene in general or the kind of top streaming and top performing artists on, on the streaming platforms, they're coming from everywhere. Uh, and that to us is really exciting and it, it's creating this marketplace that has got um, is giving everybody as much chance to, to succeed as anyone else, mm -hmm. which I think is really healthy. Yeah, and as Merlin has gotten established, and not just in Western markets, but kind of across the globe, uh, there's there's been some moments of friction with, with the majors mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea of market share. How is that kind of sussed out today? So, so the issue of market share has always been a vexed one for us from, from very early on, because if, if you... Um, the, the early days of digital licensing were really based on making companies that were trying to innovate music products pay these enormous entry taxes, um, practically to the point where their business couldn't be sustainable just to get money into the hands of the, the big record labels who would then essentially bank those checks and let those companies live or die on, on, on their own merits. That kind of model incentivizes you to be able to present yourself as as big as uh, you know as as big as possible in terms of value, and market share was the the easiest way to, to to measure that. So the higher your market share, the more of a tax you could extract, and we always thought that was a really not only an unhealthy um, dynamic in terms of how you would value the marketplace because it didn't really reflect. Um, the performance of what that particular platform was trying to build. But it also meant that there was the skewing of value. So we saw major labels claiming market share of product that they distribute physically and, and really trying to, to bolster their figures up as much as possible. The Nielsen SoundScan reports changed over time to bury more and more deep data into bigger and bigger baskets so that it was easier to, to easier and easier to make that argument. And to this day, I mean, major labels are still acquiring independent labels and distribution companies to bolster their market share up because there still is an incentive in this market to to leverage value off the back of your market share. What we've always said, and I think what the trade associations um, like A2IM and WIN and, and AIM in the UK have been working hard to establish is to say, you know, the, the value in this market comes from who creates the value and who creates the value of the people who are investing in it day to day, which is the people that we represent. So, so th you know, the, the, the question of market share continues to be slightly vexing, uh, particularly when we see independent companies sucked into the major label uh, systems. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, it's a market reality that will, will play out over time. And, and the interesting thing, just to finish on that, is as, as the scale of the market grows and the ability to be self-sustaining and to, to operate outside of those, those gatekeeper sort of systems increases, we're seeing a more natural flow of, of share out of those big baskets of, you know, controlled by those big companies back into the marketplace. So uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing um, challenge and battle. Uh, but, you know, I think at least hopefully now the market is not as constructed around these really heavy costs of entry, which, um, uh, which you know, d we think destroyed a lot of really interesting ideas in the early part of the market. Mm -hmm. So now, 10 years in, um, you're very much a global organization. Uh, can you talk about how the, the global market for music has changed in, in the age of streaming? Yeah, so uh, look, uh, I think we look at, it, we look at this in two ways. If we look at it in terms of who we represent as an organization and how many countries they came from, I think our very first press release proudly said we had 120 or 150 labels from 12 countries. I think our latest is we now, we now represent 
800 and something companies from 53 com countries around the world. So that geographic spread has really illustrating, I think, the growth in value in the marketplace. Um, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a slide here quickly, actually, that just shows um, how since 2013 to a projected figure we've got for this year, the overall value of the market is growing. And this growth is coming not just from the major markets because, you know, if you look at 2014, for example, that's when uh, Google Play and um, uh, Spotify first launched in Brazil, for example. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to LATAM uh, in a minute. But certainly the, the, the growth in value is extraordinary. I mean, just a, as a quick anecdote on this, when we first put Merlin together, we had a working group of um, people who we, we thought we'd do this blue sky exercise to work out how successful could this possibly get, like how big could Merlin get. And the biggest number anyone in that room could come up with was $10 million a year. And we thought if we could get to $10 million a year, we would, we would have created the greatest, most successful organization we can. Um, as you can see there, we're, we're earning well over a million dollars a day at the moment. So it's a um, slightly different outcome to what, what we expected at the time. Yeah. So you guys published some, some data this morning. So yeah. let's, let's run through some of that. Sure. So, so I think what, what we really um, have noticed, particularly in the last uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, is the actual shape of the market is changing. So we've, we've focused a lot in terms of how we talk to our members and how we analyze how they're performing in the market around the health of their business and, and, and the growth in their business. But we've always had this, this perception that that comes from a traditional view of the music marketplace where most of the value is in the US, then there's Japan that's very big, and then continental Europe, and then you eventually go down the food chain to, to territories that were really, really low value. I think that what's happened in Latin America in the last few years excites us a lot because it shows that not only um, is the global emergence and global spread of, the, of the, these digital streaming services taking our music to a whole range more consumers than we ever had access to, that value is now flowing back in, in really tangible terms. So this chart just shows our monthly streaming activity starting in January 2014 until um, right at the end of, uh, of last year. And that was never, you know, that was never how we expected the this market to, to develop. We always thought that this was going to be a very Euro-American centric market that eventually Japan would wake up. But you know, the, 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 this dynamic I think caught us all a little bit by surprise and is, is, is I think pointing us to looking forward into, into the next phase of the business and, and, and trying to look, understand not only where we've gotten to in the last year, in the last 10 years, but where we're going in the next 10 years. Um, I think what's happened in, the, in this period in Latin America is, is extraordinarily exciting. Mm -hmm. And what, what does this mean for, for indie labels in the US, this kind of, this growth here? Um, I mean, I think at the top level, and, and I think I've got, I've got some examples to show here of, of, of what, um, what that means, but I think what it really means for, for US indies, who, who some of you, are, I hope, in the room are, is, is you're, we're having to redefine who the potential fan is, where they live, um, how they're accessing your music, but also where the value in your business is coming from and how you plan your future around where value comes in the marketplace. Most independent labels are local businesses started around a local music scene that people are really passionate about and find artists that they want to take at, you know, at most, and, and certainly back when I used to, to do that, to their territory. And if you could break your market, that was an incredible you know, success. And then if you're lucky enough to find a distributor in Europe or Australia, then, then you know, you're really on the path to, to success. Now your music's instantly available and discoverable anywhere in the world. And, and, and for us, we're trying to understand and, and we're trying to talk to our labels to understand how they're strategizing around the fact that this is, is um, a, a, a breakdown and a shape of the market that we've never ever seen before. I mean, Latin, American, Latin America for most independent labels in the US, I can't imagine. So uh, just quick straw poll, if there's any labels in the room, how many people really made money in Chile in the last 10 years? 
you know, I mean, I think we're at a point now where this year alone in Chile we might make 12 to 15 million dollars for our labels. So that's a fundamental shift in the market. We've never, we've never really seen that before. So I think that that is part of what I think, you know, gives us confidence that the next phase of this business is, is going to take this initial growth spurt we've seen and turn it into something far more complex and interesting than, than, than we've seen to date. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, sorry, th this just flows on quickly from the other slide, and I'm not going to bore you to death with, with, with PowerPoint slides, but one, one of the, the other exciting things that we think is happening is that streaming growth that you saw in the last slide is actually ahead of what we're seeing in terms of the global growth of our business. So the, the, the bar on the right shows our year-on-year -year growth between 16 and 17 and, uh, in terms of our, our streams, where we were up uh, just over 60%. But the Latin American, which is the Latin American streams, which are on the left, actually more than doubled. So the growth rate of the um, Latin American markets in our business at the moment is actually, you know, not quite double, but but 40% higher than than what it is in the rest of our business, uh, which means that we think there's a big runway into 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 more value in those marketplaces. Mm -hmm. I think the inclination here is to kind of assume that maybe it's. U.S. and the bigger Western mm -hmm. kind of, you know, labels that are blowing up in these new corners of the world. Um, it, what does it mean for, you know, those those local labels as well? Yeah, so I, I think that, that, that cross-pollination of content um, is really interesting. But maybe if we can just jump through a couple more of these slides. So, so this, this is something that, that we, we do an annual survey where we talk to our members about the shape of their business. And last year we asked them, uh, or two years, the last two years we've asked them a question is, in the physical marketplace, how many of you make or made more money outside of your own territory than in your own territory? And as you can see, in, in a physically dominated market, only 15, 16% to 17% of people actually made more money outside of the territory they operated in than in their home market. In the digital market, that's currently, or at last year's measure, 42% of the people we represent now make more revenues in digital outside of the market in which they operate. And back to this notion of the shape of the market um, fundamentally challenging all of our preconceived notions, I think that's definitely one where if we go back to this dynamic of the local label working with its local artists in its local market, no one really ever expected that we would end up in a marketplace where you know, for, for, for the labels we surveyed, almost, you know, 42% of them have actually got an, a global business as opposed to 17%, which had a, a global business in terms of the, the physical market. And this is just, I just wanted to quickly run through these just to, to really try and put this into some shape. So this is looking at four different American labels that we represent and looking at how their music is performing outside of the USA. So, so the first one on the left there, um, is a rock and punk rock label. Almost half of their streaming activity now comes from outside of their market. Half of it from Europe, but as you can see, LATAM um, and Asia uh, and Australia and New Zealand now represent almost 50%, you know, whatever percentage that is, I'm not particularly good at adding up, but a, a far more significant part of the market than we've ever seen. Um, to explain that North America, that's the rest of North America, so that, that's, that's, that's Canada. Um, in the pop EDM market, it's a similar picture. There's half of, the, half of your revenues are coming from outside your own market, but as you can see in the, in the EDM world, uh, there's a lot more coming from outside Europe than there is in, in, in the pop and rock. The third one is the one that surprised me the most. This is a, a Nashville-based, very traditional American country music label, which is seeing, you know, between Latin America, um, Australia and Asia, around 40% of their streams coming from that. And that's not music you would traditionally think would travel out, outside of, you know, that's an inherently American form of music. And then the final chart is just a, a more standard indie rock um, KCRW, you know, leaning type label, and again, about half of their streaming revenue comes from outside of their territory, and again, Europe and the rest of the the rest of those markets is, is about 50-50. So I think again, to, to to what we're saying before about you know how many people made money in in Chile, that there's also I don't think ever in the history of the business have we seen that kind of breakdown in terms of where revenues are coming outside of your own market. For most of those labels, I would I would say in the in the in the physical market it would have been Europe and maybe Australia, New Zealand, with, with tiny, tiny percentages from those other markets. Mm -hmm. 
And and what's going on in, in some of the, the less mature territories, you know, Asia Pacific, India, and China? So, so we're far earlier into those markets than we are with these Latin American markets. But we've, so we've been in Russia for a year and a half or so and India for just over a year. And the, the growth patterns we're seeing in both of those markets as examples of markets that we've just never been in before are showing very, very similar signs to, to what we've um, to what we've seen in, in, in the emergence of the Latin American markets and that we're seeing at the moment in the, the next biggest growing region, which is all of the, the Southeast Asian markets, so Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, etc. So I, I think that this, this globalization and cross-pollination of music that, that's, um, that's happening around the world is, is not only a sort of a colonial movement where we're taking American culture into the, the uneducated world, we're actually seeing some cross-pollination happen in that. And I think I've got a, a, a couple of slides that, um, we'll skip that because that was a bit dull, but um, this is now looking at um, music coming in the other way. So the, the, the chart on the left shows a Japanese, very traditional r Japanese rock music label that we work with. Um, again, half of their streaming activity coming from outside their territory. In their, in their instance, you know, between, um, uh, Latin America um, and and Asia, they they they're you know performing almost as well as they are within within their own territory. Uh, Italian language repertoire, about a third of that activity is coming from outside of their market. Again, um, as you would expect, a lot of that consumption in in Europe, but the U.S. consumption on that and the North American consumption on that, we found really interesting. Where you know Italian language repertoire is finding a real a real home here. Uh, for German, uh, this is a German-based label that does sort of a mix between um, German electronic music but also more German sort of indie music. Again, um, significant amounts of consumption in the US and, and Latin America. And the final one is a, a Brazilian-based label, uh, which is, you know, again, very, very traditionally domestically facing label. And as you can see, it's a, it's a different pattern. Only 15% of their streaming is coming from outside their, their home territory. But uh, the, the pattern of that is, is uh, in terms of North American streams, for example, really, really surprises them. They never thought that their, their music would be finding such a home in, in, in the US and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think we're going to see if anyone out there has questions in a minute, but I have a, a couple more. Um, it's been a really busy year for, for the music industry. Um, Facebook's licensed music with all the majors now. Um, <clears throat> YouTube is apparently taking another stab at subscription and mm -hmm. Spotify is going public in, in a matter of weeks. What does all of this mean? What does this landscape mean for, for independent labels? Look, I, I think the level of activity at the moment is um, both exhausting, <laughs> but also, <laughs> I think you know encouraging, particularly, and in, in if you look at the, um, if you look at YouTube's, uh, sorry, Facebook's approach to the uh, licensing of music, where for, you know, really the first time I think we've had a big tech company, coming into our business and offering to pay us money to use our music without it really even having what an idea that much, um, which is you know comparing that to the conversation we had on on, on MySpace uh, at, at the beginning is a you know distinct market shift um, you know the, the the noises that YouTube have made in the last in a, in a week and of Leo's keynote yesterday are encouraging as well we've got these big tech companies which for a very long time have been at loggerheads with the with the industry actually leaning into our businesses and and offering to help bring value to us I think is, is a really encouraging sign and a sign that you know the, the, the value of, of music to consumers is being recognized but also the value of music within technology companies to consumers is being recognized and I think that those are things that we shouldn't underestimate in terms of how much of a, a, a tidal shift that is, that is in music over the, the, the last decade. Mm -hmm. and, and back to Spotify for a second here. There's been a lot of speculation as to how major labels who have committed to, to sharing the proceeds of any you know, stock sales um, mm -hmm. would actually do so. Um, has Merlin committed to do the same? And, and if so, how would you actually go about distributing? Sure. 
So I mean, so, so since I mean, one of the pillars of formation of the formation of Merlin is that we wanted the value that we created to flow equitably through to the marketplace. For us, the first challenges on that was when we sued LimeWire, for example, and we got a lot of money out of uh, out of that settlement. We had to work out how you could flow that money down to the people whose rights were infringed. Um, you know, because ultimately those settlements only occurred because artist music was being stolen on those platforms. So from early on, we, we felt strongly that we live in a world where there's enough data that we can, if not find exact usage on a particular platform, you can find enough data in the marketplace that would illustrate how value should flow in particular circumstances. And Spotify for us should really be the easiest because Spotify has been a legitimate business since day one. We've been in business with them since day one. We've got month by month, track by track reporting of every track of ours that's ever been streamed on Spotify. So, you know, if and when we come to sell our Spotify shares and flow them, flow those proceeds back to our members as we're compelled to do, f from what I said earlier, we think we have incredibly accurate ways to, to be able to break those money down, uh, break that money down into a, uh, a set of usage reporting that looks almost exactly like the usage reporting you get for the exploitation of your content and, and, and flow that down. But certainly, you know, from, from a, you know, you're talking about earlier about what are the, uh, what were the, the factors that attracted growth into Merlin, and I think that access to that kind of equitable um, uh, distribution of those monies that had been sort of flowing off into these mysterious boxes in the sky, I think was 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 a big appeal to people. And and you know, I'd say the other thing the independence labels have done from very early on, and for for you know three or four years ago, um, the organisation Win, which is a, a global trade association for independence, did a fair digital deals directive, which was really a challenge to the rest of the market to say, we think that there's really equitable ways to to distribute this. Uh, money. We don't think it should remain locked inside corporate entities. We think it should flow through. And they've got an enormous number of labels around the world that, are, that have signed that. So we have confidence that the independent community is far more forward thinking and, and, and equitable in terms of how we'll deal with any of those kind of distributions. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question for me. Uh, this year, Merlin turns 10. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, has the commercial importance of independent music changed? In the, in the past decade? I really like to think that it has because I, I think, you know, we, we, we run so fast that we don't have often stop and, and reflect as to what's actually happening on a, on, a, uh, on a larger sort of level other than what we do in licensing all of these platforms and growing the business and doing all of these things that we're showing to here. But, you know, we, we certainly don't feel now that we're the, the poor farmer in the room who's trying to sell their potatoes to the supermarkets. You know, I think, I think this is, um, it's well established now that independent labels are holding their own in the digital space, that in many ways they're leading what's happening in the digital space. Um, I think the global, the global growth of these platforms and our success on these platforms is another incontrovertible measure that, that we um, are making music that is attractive to consumers, that they want to make as you know, part of their listening experience and, and part of their musical lives. And it's, you know, it'll be very, very difficult in that, in this environment now to mount any argument that says, well, because an artist is signed for Universal, they should get paid more than an artist that's signed to, um, you know, the Secretly Group in, in the US. I mean, I think those arguments have become more and more absurd. And, and you know, sort of tying it back to, to this global growth, the, the latest we've, we've seen on that and where there's a press release coming out later today is, you know, we've managed to approach the Chinese market in a totally different way um, to what the major labels have, um, you know, with their exclusive deals and their, their big upfront cash payment type deals. And, you know, even in a market like China, which we think, given all of this growth we're seeing everywhere, well, uh, everywhere else in, in, in the, the, uh, the, the non sort of traditional music markets is growing, is potentially another, you know, huge source of, 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 of growth for us. And to have, you know, really big corporations in those markets able to, to strike deals with us that we think are going to be healthy and sustainable for the long term future, uh, that makes me really optimistic about where we head from here. Great. Great. All right, and with that, I think we can turn it over to the crowd if anyone has questions. I think there's microphones, if you, or you can just shout it out. 
Hi, I've got a question around um, publishing, streaming, and labels. Is there potential for, and, and maybe I might have the facts wrong as well, but is there mm -hmm. potential to move towards a more favored nation clause between publishing and labels through streaming versus like similar to Sync, where there's a 50-50 on both sides? Um, just with the elimination of the mechanical royalty coming back that used to be on physical, it seems like a lot of the discussion around problems with streaming exist on the songwriter side more than the label side. So I'm just curious of where Merlin stands and if you know of any innovative deals that are being done to compensate for the fact of the lack of a mechanical on a streaming. Um, I mean, we represent record labels and the master right, so we really, um, I can't profess to talk with any level of authority on, on the publishing world. But, you know, clearly a, a market that changes the way in which music moves and is consumed throws up all sorts of challenges. And I think one of the challenges it throws up is, is what you've described. Um, if you're asking me if I have a solution for that, then I, I'm sorry, I don't today. Because Merlin but, would, would have to give up something, right, to allow that to happen, probably because the labels would lose, get less if the publishers got more. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily correct. I, okay. I think there's there's all sorts of ways that value chains can be constructed between digital services and rights holders that shift margin around in all sorts of ways. So, um, I mean, I, look, I, I know that there's that there's impediments in that particular part of the world, and I know that there's there's feelings, you know, strong feelings about that. But there's been a new ruling here in the U.S. about you know the 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 streaming copyright um, rates, for example. So I think it, it, it's a watch this space, but, but I, don't, I don't think there's a 30-second there's a, there's a snappy answer <laughs> to that question. It's a, it's a tough question. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Charlie, good to see you. Uh, David Lessoff from Ingroove's Music Group, hey. uh, Merlin member. I was wondering, we've been talking about what led up to today, the 10 years and the success of Merlin. Can you speak to a little bit to what's coming in the future in terms of the Asian marketplace? China and the hopes of Merlin in some other territories. We, we're seeing enormous growth in Latin, mm -hmm. but obviously there's some opportunity in, in Asia. And I was just wondering if you could speak to the group about that subject. Sure. So, so I think you know here we focused on Latin because it, it's a little bit more mature than than the than what we've seen in some of these other emerging markets. I think that the the Japanese market is an obvious opportunity which has been very resistant to streaming for a long time and is just starting to embrace that. I mean, Japan used to be the number two music market in the world. I don't think it's anywhere near that anymore. And there's a precedent for that in that, you know, Germany was a late adopter of streaming and really lost a lot of value relative to other markets. But, but I think, you know, if we look forward from here, I think we certainly see this globalization of the business as an, as an enormous opportunity. And both ways, by the way, uh, you know, in, in terms of what we tried to illustrate there, I think the success of Latin music in the US in the last year is a really strong indicator that you know, music culturally is starting to flow in different ways. So I think creatively that's really interesting and exciting. Um, the fact that that's tied into value and that we can actually start building revenues into this consumption of the music, because you know, maybe all of that music was being stolen 10 years ago, and we might have been performing as well as we are now. We just never knew about it because no money was flowing through. But, but you know, to, to the first part of your question, you know, we're, we're thinking obviously a lot at the moment because we're at this landmark of, of looking back 10 years is to say, okay, well, taking where we are now, what do we think happens next? And, and, and I think that there's, there's two or three things that I think we definitely feel is, is happening. The first we alluded to earlier, which is it's becoming easier to run a sustainable um, music business outside of the, the confines of the major labels, which I think is great for the consumer, it's great for the industry, it's great for innovation and creativity, and changes that imbalance of power that's existed until now. I think all of that concentration in the hands of such few companies is not really good for anyone. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. And then if I think of, you know, and, and then I think the other encouraging part of that is, as we said, tech companies leaning in, trying to build music into, into their value chain so that they can find ways to not only benefit from the use of our music, but flow that benefit back to us is another it's another sea change that, that we're just starting to see happen. And you know, we'll, we'll see. We're, we're reserving judgment on, on how serious and how impactful that will be. But at least it's a much better starting point to, to where we were from before. 
Then I think that the, the long, slightly longer term challenge is how do we see the access to, to music evolving? You know, at the moment we're in a very um, segmented consumer market for online entertainment, for, for want of a better word, streaming entertainment. So you've got a Netflix subscription, you've got a Apple Music subscription, you might have cable, you might subscribe to Angry Birds, I don't know, whatever you, you if anyone pays for those kind of things. Um, but it's all segmented and they're all different checks. You know, the, the, there's a lot of speculation about the cableization of that where you start having an all-encompassing subscription that maybe breaks down your entertainment into, into various chunks. Whilst I think on the one hand that's exciting, and that hand in hand with smart cars and smart devices and connected televisions and, and all of those integrated, you know, voice activated entertainment opportunities, I can see that there's potentially a value challenge around that where you start putting different sets of rights holders into the same basket, there's going to be some, some bruising. Um, but I think, you know, overarchingly, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the labels we represent are really optimistic about, about what's happening um, to the business. I think companies like yours are well poised to, to, to benefit from, from these changes in the marketplace. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I came a couple minutes late, so I hope you didn't uh, speak about this and I sure. just missed it. But we've talked a lot about, or you've talked a lot about global issues, um, macro issues, which is great. Could you speak a minute about, more at a more micro level, about the value of actual streams um, and what they are currently, and perhaps just elaborate a little bit uh, on how that has changed over the, the past several years um, and how you negotiate those? Sure. You missed it. it was in the that was my first two minutes. <laughs> um, I think one of the... One of the if, if we're talking about the value of consumption, which I think is what you're, what you're, what you're asking about here, um, we've been thinking for quite a while now that we need to change... In the, in the way that I'm saying we need to change our perception about where value comes in the market and, and where, where value comes from, where your fans are, how your business is constructed, what does marketing mean, what does, how does playlisting fit into social media and all the rest of it. I think we also have to learn how to value what's happening to our music. We've come from this unit-based economy where we sold X amount of records and those X amounts of records had a wholesale price attached to them. I think what we're tracking much more closely is the value of each consumer that comes into the marketplace and the value they bring to our business by being inside the monetization chain. And so that, um, at that micro level, the more people shift from free users of music to paid users of music, the more that revenue per user increases. And I think certainly right now, the value of the consumer and the value of a consumer to our business and what they bring into to the overall value chain is a really un, under-considered factor. And I think a lot of people are focusing on um, you know, this unit-based kind of view of the world where we're trying to break everything down into, into units. I don't think the unit is, is as important a measure as it, as it has been in the past. I don't exactly know where that heads in terms of um, what the future valuation of, of, of um, music as, as, a, as a whole inside of these broader ecosystems that I was talking about. But I do think we need to, in some ways, break that traditional thinking about what we're selling. And I don't think we're anymore selling these individual units of, of consumption anymore. We're selling access to that, to that music by virtue of a, a higher value consumer coming in than when they were free. And in this early, f and I still think, by the way, we're in this very early age of transition from uh, a, a market that was dominated by piracy to a market that's dominated, or digital market dominated by piracy, to a digital market dominated by consumers willing to pay for music. Um, we certainly need to track that, and our, organize, our organization exists to uphold the value of music. But I think we're, we're taking a, a slightly broader view of what that value is and where it comes from and, and, and how it flows to, to, to the consumer. So I suppose that just to finish that, a slightly different way to look at that is, you know, is it better to have um, one, you know, 10 consumers 
listening to 10 songs each generating a dollar a stream, or a million consumers each generating, uh, each listening to a thousand tracks each and generating a tenth of a dollar per stream. Like what's, what's the bigger value in, in the long term to that? And uh, you know, volume is definitely going to be a big part of how, of how we value this market going forward. Uh, hello, sorry for my bad English, maybe. Uh, but for me, as a maker, I'm 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 like an old-fashioned radio guy, but also streaming on YouTube or making a podcast. And well, at this moment, it, it isn't allowed to use the music. Um, how long will it take? You think that every listener of my stream will be seen as an extra stream for that particular song? Because that's how it's gonna work. It's it's now like it's forbidden to play a song on the radio, which is of course uh, a bit weird. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that question. So you how long do you think it will take that, uh, well, uh, podcast makers can use music and, and uh, in, in, in a YouTube stream or whatever kind of stream you can use all the music? How long do you think that will take? I mean, I think, I think what you're alluding to is, is uses of music and without it being within a streaming direct stream of that particular piece of content but bundled into another piece of content like a podcast. User-generated content? Yeah. Look, I, I, th I think the, the whole notion of, of how and where user-generated content is allowed to live is in part a technological challenge and in part a licensing challenge. And I think there's always this balance between value and innovation. Um, you know, you mentioned YouTube. There's the perfect, you know, um, long-term battle between innovation and, and reach and how do you value that, right? And so there, there's eventually that'll find some form of equilibrium, we, we hope. Um, I, again, it's not something I have an, an easy answer for, but I think that technology solves those kind of issues by finding innovations that are monetizable and finding ways to easily monetize them, because really all we're, we're all here about um, maximizing the value to creators of, of music, and that, that's our responsibility. So, so the more revenue streams we can find that are sustainable and, 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 and equitable, then the more we'll support them in the same that you know in the same way we were the first service to license SoundCloud back in the day when we were the first rights holder to license SoundCloud back in the day where everybody saw SoundCloud as a big problem we saw it for our labels as a massive opportunity to create a whole new revenue stream outside of the the traditional streaming services and as it happens over time that's become a fully licensed service that now has commercial offerings so i think that's probably a great example of something that was seen as unmonetizable and sitting outside of our business that by engaging with it and understanding it and finding ways to to extract value for the use of your music on those platforms has actually created value back to to the people that we represent The, one of the debates at the moment is about user-centric models in streaming. Mm -hmm. um, as Merlin represents uh, maybe more niche repertoire than mainstream repertoire, mm -hmm. have you done any uh, research into this and do you have a view on it for the future? We, we've seen some early research. For, for those people who aren't um, aware of what this is, so, so there's, at the moment, the way streaming services monetize is all the money goes into, into a pot, so everybody's ten dollars that I'm sure you're all paying goes into goes into a pot, and then all of the music that you all listen between between you gets distributed according to that pot. The user centric model basically says that each of you individually will create a ten dollar pot, and then whatever you listen to, the, the the money will spread on that. We're we're working with one service at the moment to try and get some really deep data as as to where and how that that actually plays out for us. Um, the initial indicators we've had is that there might not be a massive difference, but there might be differences in territories where English is not the first language or where domestic repertoire is important. Um, so, so, but the thing that slightly concerns us is the best that it's shown is that we're going to be no worse off, and the worst that it's shown is actually we're going to be quite a lot worse off under that model because pop fans listen to the same artists over and over again at, at high volumes. So where that balance plays out in the end, we'd like to see better. But you know, it's it's we'd love to see more data about that and to to actually see how that understands. We we have we have no particular view on what um, what's a better system or not. 
So if, if the user-centric model ends up being a model that's sustainable and, and, and equitable and, and, and it works for us in the marketplace, then, then we would support that. But I think we need to see a lot deeper and a lot more robust analysis of what that actually means because I think you know, the, the, we, we certainly see in terms of our consumption on streaming platforms, for example, that independent music tends to do much, much better amongst paid users than free users. So the fact that paid users listen to more of our music in the paid environment, does that mean in a user-centric model that we're penalised because we're generating more streams across really heavy music users? Or does it mean that we benefit as a net across the entire platform? Um, I, again, not, not, not a 30-second answerable question, but certainly something we're keeping an eye out on. Okay, I think that's our time. Thanks, guys, for coming, and thank you for your questions, and thank you, Charles, for thank chatting. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, thank you very much.